Hello, everyone. My name is Sal Mirza, and I'm a PhD candidate here in the Biomedical Engineering Program at FIU. And I work in the Fisher Honor of Lab doing CFD, FEA simulations on periodic valve uh, types of geometries for optimization and uh, proced uh, procedural planning purposes to overly condense my project. But for now, um, I'm just going to teach you guys a little 101 on how ANSYS works for finite element analysis. So first, how will they even get ANSYS? Well, um, ANSYS provides a free student version that has everything that you want to use. And you can use it um, so long as it's for a classroom, homework, capstone project, competition, or uh, some other academic purpose. It supports Microsoft Windows 64-bit only. And uh, currently, the latest version is the 2021 R2. And it has everything you need, for example, ANSYS Mechanical, which is used for structure analysis, ANSYS CFD for fluid simulations, ANSYS Autodyne for explicit analysis, which is for things that are fast moving like bullet impacts, blasts, crashes. It also has its own CAD software called ANSYS Space Plane, which is like SOLIDWORKS as Fusion 360 in a way. And it also has something called uh, ANSYS Design Store, which is used for running DOE or design of experiments under models, so you can iterate on different concepts and basically like crank different levers of your model to see how it affects um, some outcome that you're interested in. And the other way you can get access is directly through FIU. So if you use um, FIU's remote computer access, you can directly um, log in through a VPN into the lab computers and then access uh, ANSYS Workbench, which has everything ANSYS related in it um, directly through your own computer. And the details of setting this up can be found on ANSYS on uh, the EIC site for remote computer access. And if I run this verification. So they can see it here and it gives you instructions or it's even a video on how you can use it. And for the ANSYS student, you can literally just search it up. And you can see here you have ANSYS student. And you can download it directly from the site, and it's valid for a full year. And yeah, that's how you get access to it. And let me bring it back here. So first off, what is finite element analysis? Um, and so is it a pretty picture maker? Is it an example of garbage in, garbage out, a powerful simulation tool, or a mathematical tool for solving boundary boundary problems? As I'm sure you can uh, guess, it's actually all the above. And in the wise words of Burmary, one does not simply perform finite element analysis. There is an art to it, essentially, um, as strange as that might sound. So what you have to do for finite element analysis is you basically take a very large, complex problem, and you break it up into a finite number of what are called elements. And you simplify each piece, meaning you simplify the math, and you do the math on each of these little elements, and then you reassemble all the pieces together, which would be um, all your little matrix equations. And then you solve this entire matrix as a single equation. And then you can figure out the stresses and strains across the entire structure by just building up the information you have on each individual little element. And so there are various steps that you do for this. So the first is you have to define your problem. For example, what do you know and what do you want to know? You have to uh, create a clean model to work on. So simplify geometry and what your material properties are. You have to define what your loads and constraints are. So where are you applying your forces or loads? What, what areas are being fixed or not moving in space? Then you have to mesh or break up your model into those finite little elements, as I talked about. Then you have to define what type of analysis you're doing. Is this a fluid simulation? Is this a thermal type of simulation? Is this a structural simulation? Is it a combination of multiple different kinds? And then you submit it to what's called the black box because you don't actually do any of the analysis yourself. You leave it up to a solver that does it either iteratively or through explicit solvers that you don't need to know about. You just know that the software makes sense to do it. And then you trust the software to do it because it's been validated by multi million dollar companies. And then you get your results back and then you close process. So you can look at the stresses, the strain, the safety factor. If it's CFD, you take a look at the washer stresses, the way 
fluid furnace these are. If it's heat analysis, you can look at temperature concentrations. You can look at thermal stresses. If it's electrical type of simulation, you can take a look at any charge accumulated regions or how field lines are going through your model and so on and so forth, depending on what type of analysis you did. Now, this black box I'm referring to is basically the internal map that happens when you're doing these analysis. So in the cases of a structural analysis, here's how it works out. So first you define a very simplified relationship between loads and displacements for each of those little elements that you broke up your full model in, and then you write it in a matrix form. So you have your forces, you have your displacements, and you have what's called your stiffness matrix. So you know what your um, uh, forces are because you're applying them on the boundaries. So this region is not moving, this region has a force on it, this region's rotating, whatever. K would be all your material properties, unique things about each of your elements. This element's not allowed to move um, in this direction. This element has a young spot of this. This element has a density of that, so on and so forth. And the idea is you, each of the elements are linked to all other elements. So whatever one element feels, it's the input for another element. And then that element feeds to another element. And then that element feeds to another element. And once you, sort of constructed this gigantic matrix where each element is related to something else, then all you have to do is basically invert the matrix, which is very straightforward um, uh, numerical technique to calculate what the known displacements are. And once you know what the displacements are, you can compare them to the initial configuration and that's how you get strains. And then if you know material properties, for example, you know, modulus, Poisson's ratio, or some whatever material properties you have for your object, then you can also figure out what stresses you are dealing with. And then from there, you can go on and do fatigue analysis and what have you. So and that would be a post-processing step. So once again, to reiterate, the basic FEA terminology you'll probably hear, you have your model, it's broken, bit, broken up into small little what are called elements, and each element has a bunch of nodes which are shared between the elements. You have boundary conditions that the, that um, describe how the edges of your model are working on. So in this case, this boundary condition is fixing it to this wall as if it was glued up against the wall, preventing it from motion. Then you have this other similar boundary condition, which is called a nodal node, where you're assuming that um, the forces that are transferred uh, from this node to its neighboring nodes, but for vertically, it's actually uh, receiving a force downward of some amount of newtons or maybe it's pressure or something similar. And that's basically the super simplified FEA stuff. Um, usually there, there's what have multiple forces associated with it, but hopefully this gives you a general idea of how all this works. Now, before I continue, any questions? Nope. All right, so why should you submit? Well, the whole idea is if you wanna figure out the actual answer to a problem, you can see if there's an analytical solution. But this only works in very simplified cases. Um, and it only works if the assumptions required to simplify your equations are the same ones you're working with. So this is this is a case of, oh, um, you assume that something's a sphere or something's a perfect cube or something's a cylinder, or you have perfect uh, transport of the uh, temperature, you have perfect material, and so on and so forth. Um, you just have the basic perfect ideal test cases, in which case the analytical is the answer. But oftentimes you're not dealing with that. You're dealing with a complicated shape. You're dealing with boundary conditions that are changing and not stringent. So the next best thing you can do is experimental because if you have experimental data, it's very accurate because it's built on the actual thing that you're testing on, but it's limited in scope and it's actually very expensive. So you, you only have as many data points as whatever you're measuring and you don't know anything other than that one little point you were measuring at. And oftentimes it can be expensive because you actually have to make the thing that you're trying to simulate um, and grab the data from. So instead what you do is you do um, a computational simulation. And this can be just as accurate as an experimental, but usually it's cheaper and provides far more information because as of now you have um, probes everywhere in your model to grab data from and not just one little spot. The issue is that, as I said before, the computational approach is only as accurate as what you're feeding into the model in the first place. If you're feeding it garbage, you'll get garbage out. 
if you're filling it as accurate to real life data as you have, you'll get as accurate to real life results at the end of it because the equations that it's built upon are actual physical equations that we know and have validated in real life. So that's where ANSYS comes in. ANSYS is an engineering software originally developed by, in 1970 by Dr. Johnny Swanson. Originally, very originally, it was, a, it was developed for FEA analysis of structural problems. But nowadays it can be structural, thermal, electrical, fluid, acoustic, magnetic, biological, as well as do CAD generation through geometry, meshing, optimization, and it can do many, 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 many more things. Uh, in general, in my field of work, I mainly deal with the fluid and structures and partly multi-physics of how they couple together. But there are other people in our department who deal more with the electronics, the semiconductors, or um, other parts of ANSYS's gigantic workload. But uh, yeah, as far as I concerned, it's mainly fluid structures and the way they relate. So just to interest you guys, here are some ANSYS examples I pulled off online. So this is an example of a CFD analysis where you have two different fluids mixing together. Here's an example of a tower valve, which is closer to what my research is. So as you can see here, the uric sinus, and you have two different tower valves and how um, the velocity is changing as you're going through it, as well as the stresses on it. And so you can compare different design concepts without actually having to do the surgery on a patient. Then you have examples of a phone drop test. So for example, how are the stresses concentrated in your model um, with and without a case? And uh, you can see here that without a case, you have more variation and stability in the, in the acceleration and resulting stresses. But once you put a case in, it dampens the forces and provides a more smoother transfer of force. You can also do things, for example, truck design and deployment optimization. So you could try to see how to reduce the energy loss from uh, going against the wind and uh, which reduces your drag coefficient. So you can see how the pumps optimally arrange trucks to move against each other. And then you could also do things, for example, car crash simulations to see where your model is strong, where it's weak, where it's gonna buckle, where it's not gonna buckle. And this is an example of an explicit analysis. And similarly, you can do bullet impact analysis uh, to see where shrapnel is gonna happen, where it's gonna break from, if your product is gonna be able to withstand um, uh, impact at high velocities. So as you can see, ANSYS pretty much can do anything and everything you want, pretty much it depends upon what you want it to do. And if you have the available information on what constraints you're working with. All right, so first things first, I wanna say never simulate for any pretty pictures or just because, always simulate to answer a question that you cannot answer normally. So because there's a resource constraint, meaning you have limited material to actually test on, you have a financial constraint, so you have limited funds from your sponsor or something, there's a time constraint. So doing a normal test while maybe you have the resources and financial capabilities, actually making it and doing the test is uh, time consuming, which would waste weeks, so you can't do that, and et cetera, et cetera. In all of these cases, go ahead and simulate to figure out what the answer is. And usually the workflow goes like this. You have a problem, you create a model of the problem, you simulate using the conditions you have, you analyze the results. Did you find a solution that you're looking for? Awesome, you're done. If you didn't, make adjustments to your model, simulate again, analyze the results to find a solution. No, keep iterating until you find an answer to whatever you're looking for. And this way, uh, you would simulate for a reason. So let's go ahead and do an uh, actual example. So here's gonna be a load bearing bracket type of um, simulation. And the question is, how can you design a bracket to withstand a given load, let's call it X, while minimizing its weight and peak stresses? So the way we're gonna do this is we create a normal back bracket geometry. We're gonna run a, sta a steady state stru uh, static structural simulation to figure out locations of the max stresses. Then we're gonna redesign the bracket to minimize the weight and peak stresses. And then you just reiterate one to three until you minimize its weight enough and you reduce the peak stresses enough to within whatever criteria you're interested in. So our low bearing bracket is gonna be this uh, thing I made in SolidWorks. Yeah, it's fairly standard. You have these little holes that are 10 millimeter diameter 
uh, there are four here that can uh, you can imagine you can bracket it up against the wall. It's one dimension is seven time millimeters. The lengthwise can be under fifty, and you have loads that are on these little protrusions here. So in terms of boundary conditions, that means that we have a fixed load at these places where you would theoretically screw it into a wall or something, and you have a force. So something would hang from both of these, and we're gonna assume that's gonna be twenty five thousand. So let's go ahead and open up a Blink Workbench uh, project. So when you open up ANSYS Workbench, this is what it looks like. It's basically the central area that you're gonna be working in. And over here on the left, you have all your different analysis systems. So for example, if you wanna do electric, eigenvalue buckling, fluid flow analysis, uh, extrusions, um, if you wanna do sound type of simulation, so you have harmonic acoustics, LS Dyna for explicit analysis. Uh, you also have thermal analysis down here, thermal electric, if you want to combine those. So pretty much everything you could possibly imagine is somewhere on this list of the left. But for us, we're going to dealing with the nice little case of static flow. So just go ahead and grab it, drag it here. And the first thing you're going to see is it's numbered one through seven. So this is the order that you actually work in. So first you define your engineering data. This would be like your material properties and what you know about your object. Then you define your geometry. Then you define the model or the mesh. Then you define the setup, which is where you would put your boundary conditions and everything. Then this is your solution node, which would be like your black box. And then post-process the results and see what you got. So if we open up engineering data, you can see here, by default, ANSYS, ANSYS always needs a material properly loaded in, so we're always assumed uh, structural steel to start off with. And for our uh, demonstration case, we're also going to assume structural steel. And you can see here, structural steel is defined with density. It also is assuming isotropic elasticity, so you have your Young's modulus and units of Pascal's. You have your Poisson's ratio, bulk modulus, shear modulus. You have what's called uh, the SN curve. So let me go here. So for our bracket, we're going to need to know a couple of things. One of the things that I already talked about was the Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio from structural steel. But the other thing is, if we want to know how long it can last, we need to do what's called a uh, fatigue analysis on it. And to do a fatigue analysis, what you need to know is the SN curve of your material. Um, and this basically tells you how many cycles your materials can last under a given amount of stress. So if you go back here, you can see here, um, it's in terms of log, um, and I think it's in log 10. So you can think of this as uh, 10 to the second, so 100 cycles, 1,000 cycles, 4,000 cycles, 5,000, not 4,000. Uh, this is 100 cycles, this will be 1,000, this will be uh, 10,000, a million, so on and so forth. And the idea is when you have your part and you apply a load to it, that's a cycle. And what happens a lot of times is when you do a fatigue analysis, you assume your part is going to be undergoing that, that uh, load over and over and over and over and over again. And uh, because of that uh, repetitive cycle use, the part actually starts building up internal stresses and can break even below the theoretical ultimate uh, uh, ultimate strength or ultimate uh, uh, stress that your material might be rated for, just because you're using it over and over and over and over again. And so this graph describes that, oh, if you're using your product just once, it could theoretically withstand this much stress before breaking. But if you use it for, let's say, 5 million cycles, then it can actually break at a lower amount of stress than what its corresponding ultimate tensile strength might be. And that's why these types of graphs are important. So using this information, now we're going to switch over to the actual CAD. And in terms of CAD, the way I always work is it's always best to make the CAD in ANSYS Space Claim or Design Modeler, which are two different engineering softwares that uh, ANSYS has built in. Because it's more, uh, because it's built in, it works well with ANSYS. But if you don't have that, you can also work with SolidWorks, AutoCAD, CADIA, and just directly import those files. The third best thing you can do is work with what are called STEP or IGS files. And those can be exported from pretty much any CAD software that you have. 
and then that can be directly imported into Sol into ANSYS. And the last thing is if you only have an STL, and I really don't suggest you work with STLs because STLs are literally just floating triangles in space, and they have no notion of uh, curvature or surfaces or anything. So you have to do a lot of pre-processing to figure out how to return the, all these triangles back to original shape. So if you can, work in this order. So what I have, if you right click this, you can make a new geometry in space in space plane or design modeler. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna import a geometry that I already have from uh, SolidWorks. So you can directly import a SolidWorks part. So I have it as bracket underscore V1. And you see it loaded automatically. And if we wanted to see it, then we can do an edit geometry in space lane. And this will open up ANSYS space lane so you can take a look at your geometry. So while this is loading up, any questions? Is the reason a step files work is because they're neutral formatted, correct? And same thing with IGS. Yeah, and they have built in metadata on things like uh, units and uh, any de defined surfaces you have. So it's a friendly CAD bot, essentially. Cool, I didn't know that. And I guess just to, to recap those who might not understand what direct modeling is, uh, what, how, how is it different from SOLIDWORKS in that sense? All right, so in SOLIDWORKS, when you make a uh, object, you have that little design tree that you're working with where you can go through each of the little steps. In direct modeling, it's actually a very free form. So there's no history or anything for this beyond just like a control Z that you have. And in this case, so here's the object directly imported from SOLIDWORKS. You have these options to pull, move, or fill faces. So for example, let's say I want to completely uh, get rid of this whole um, hole region right here and go right through it. Then I can do a pull, drag it, and that hole is, that hole is completely gone. Or let's say I want to raise this face, grab it, raise it, done. Or let's say I want to increase the fillet on this, grab it, and extend it, or extend it the other way if it allows. Or let's say I have this hole here and I want to get rid of it, just click the hole and click fill, and it gets rid of the hole. And this is all direct modeling because there's no actual history of you doing any of this beyond the undo. So I did a fill, I did an offset, I did an extrude on a face. So you can go backwards in that sense, not in terms of individual design histories like SolidWorks would have. So I guess pros and cons for the user. For the user, uh, direct modeling is a lot more freeform, I guess. So whatever crazy idea you have in your mind, you can quickly make something just to see if it works. And then afterwards, if you want, you can do a more uh, indirect modeling approach where you actually go into SolidWorks and have your little individual steps to make everything. But you can also do something similar in ANSYS where you can have, uh, uh, what's it called? For example, uh, if you do an extension here, you see a little number right there. Well, you can put whatever number you want to get exact values. And you can also turn that into an actual parameter if you wanted to, but that's all beyond the scope of whatever we're doing. <laughs> So naturally, this is not the product that we were working on. So undo, guess we're undo, 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 purge everything. This, I click replace. All right, so now that that's done, you can right click this and now edit your model. And this will be how you're starting to make your mesh. So while that's opening up. So the purpose of meshing, as I explained before, you want to do your simulation on discrete components or discrete little elements. And the type of element you use can actually vary. So you can have what, what are called the uh, tetrahedral elements. You can have hexahedral, you can have pyramids, you can have prisms. And there are advantages and disadvantages to each, but uh, going into the nitty gritty of when to use which is way beyond the scope of this. But just know by default, ANSYS will always try to use tetrahedrons because they're the most compact in terms of space and quality. Um, and usually if you're trying to deal with any kind of fluid simulation, better to use prisms in that um, I found, prisms and hex uh, hexahedrons. 
Now, the meshing is a pretty much an art form all on its own. So a lot of times students think, oh, if I make a dense, denser mesh, the denser the better. Not necessarily, because a lot of times you have uh, various parts of your model that are overly detailed that the mesh will try to capture, but do you really need to capture the details around that little spot? That depends. So are there areas in your model that you can remove? So for example, in you, in this little a demonstration piece right here, you have this little sharp corner here that transitions to the circular face. Do you need that corner? If not, then you might as well just get rid of it and make this a smooth surface, because if you leave it in, um, what ANSYS will try to do will be to try to capture the unique characteristics around that sharp corner, and it will add a lot of elements there that might not be needed at all. And you can also do what's called refinements. So you can see how um, the stresses you get around your, your uh, different parts of your model mainly depend upon how small of an element you have. So if you want to capture what the stresses and flow gradients are if you're doing a CFD analysis, you're going to need to capture a denser mesh around that region. And in this case, you would put a denser mesh around uh, features you hear about. So maybe a denser mesh around the bolt hole, or for if you're doing the fluid domain, you would do a boundary layer to capture what the fluid's doing as it gets very close to your wall, where usually it would get have a no slipping and uh, uh, read zero velocity at the wall. And it's down. And in this way, um, you also have to work uh, worry about efficiency. So if you have more elements, then that's more computational resources. But if you have more elements, you get a more accurate solution as well. So you can see here, if you underestimate the amount of elements you need, you see a fluid uh, flow development occurring. But if you accurately capture what the uh, elements should be as you get closer to the wall and capture fluid dynamics properly, you can see a more gradual gradient development as would be expected based off uh, Bernoulli's principle and such. So how do you determine whether or not your meshing quality is good or not? You have different uh, aspects that you can do. So one of them is uh, um, what's called skewness and what's called orthogonal quality. Uh, skewness basically means how relatively distorted is that element from how it's usually supposed to be. Zero means no skewness, and which is excellent. And one is completely skewed, which is unacceptable. Orthogonal quality is how relates how close the angles between each adjacent element base are to some optimal angle that's supposed to be. So for example, if it's supposed to be triangle elements, then each element is supposed to be lateral, so it's supposed to be 60 degrees apart. But if for whatever reason you're doing some weird complicated curved service, then the uh, angle that it ends up making is not actually a perfect 60 degrees, in which case the orthogonal quality will be off. And orthogonal quality goes the opposite way from skewness. Uh, our thought quality has zero being unacceptable, one being excellent. Usually I aim for 0. 0.6 and above. So how do you actually go about doing meshing? So now here's our actual product that we loaded in without, without all the weird changes. On the left here, you have your geometry. And if you click it, you'll see by default, it applies it to structural steel, but you can apply whatever material you assigned. Um, in this model, or you can look up one if it's available in ANSYS uh, material library. So for example, um, if you're dealing with like plastics, then maybe your part is made of APS, in which case you can apply it here. And if you want, you can actually take a look at what material properties are related to this particular thing and then assign it. If not, just stick with the basics. Then you can, if you wanted to, you could define custom coordinate systems, cylindrical, spherical, what have you. And here's the meshing. By default, if you just generate a mesh, ANSYS will try its best to make a mesh for your product. But uh, if you can see here, it's fairly coarse. And if you go to statistics, it's only 2,099 elements. As a sort of uh, baseline, and when I do my publication level of simulations, I generally deal in the millions of elements. So you can see how this would be a very coarse type of uh, mesh to work with, but maybe this is enough to figure out what your design is going to be. So it really depends on your individual use cases. So you can control what the element sizes are. So the default is this, but what if let's say we want each element to be no more than one millimeter large, then you can make this one. And if you click generate, then it will go through each of the faces and then fill it with a one millimeter at a maximum element size. 
And now you can see we have a more finer element across everything. And if you want to see what it looks like inside, you can do a section plane down here. So if I do a run like this, make a new section here, and I cut across this, you can see the internal tetrahedral elements and how they're more fine where you have regions of uh, curvature, but less fine internally. All of this you can control if you want to. Now, for our purposes, if you had set up a, a element size of 10, you would have been able to see an element quality that goes down to 0.06 all the way up to 1. So usually you want to increase the lowest element uh, quality size as high as you can. So in this case, if you had set the element size down to about 0 0.5, then the minimum would have been about 0.2. And so this suggests that maybe tetrahedrons aren't the best element to use for this. So you could have actually changed what type of element you would use. To do that, let's turn off the sectioning. And you click back here. You can see the element size here. If you right click this, click insert, click method. First thing it's going to ask you is what um, uh, object do you want to do it on? You click here. So you can select vertex, edge, base, or body. In this case, body, and it selects the body. And now you can select what type of method you want. So by default, it was doing tetrahedrons, but maybe you want to do a hex, uh, hexahedral elements. So if you do hexahedral elements, now it's going to try to fill everything with hexahedral elements instead. But yeah, if you had changed it up here, you would have been able to change the method. So you could have done a multi-zone, Cartesian, hexahedral, what have you. But let's just stick with automatic. And just to make this go faster, let's stick with a 2.5. Run it. Done. And if you want to actually see the element quality, you can go down here to quality, mesh metric. And then you have this drop-down list of various ways you can uh, measure quality of your elements. So the first one is the element quality. You can see here, oh, these elements are between 0.38 to 0.5, or maybe these elements are going to be the ones that are above 0.75. These are the ones that are from 0.88 to 1, or maybe you want to see just the ones that are at the lowest quality. So you have this random little sliver at the edge here that's like below 0.12 and 0.25, or you have one right here, which are more sparse, but they're from this is the 0.25 element quality. So using this, you can sort of gauge where are regions that you need to improve on the quality. And if you want to see the colorful image representation of all this, you click here on display styles and click element quality. And now you can see here the actual element quality with a corresponding legend. And if you take a look at the section analysis, Does it not want to show? Just it doesn't want to show up when you're doing the section. Whatever. But yeah, this is how you can view all that. Oh, and one more thing I want to show before you actually conduct the simulation. If you want to save a picture of anything you have, then what you can do is sort of move it around so it looks exactly how you want it to look like. Let's say like this. Then you can click here to images. And then you can either save it as a figure, in which case it gets saved to your actual project file or you can export it as directly to an image file or to your clipboard or so on and so forth. So if you do like image to file, they can say, oh, I want a high resolution image, include the legend if there is one, I want a white background. And then you can control how you want to save it as a PNG, JPEG, TIFF, so on and so forth. And this is how I saved up um, these images I'm going to show you later where we're looking at the results. So with that, done. Now when you actually do the simulation. So now you click the stack structural node here and you can actually uh, go down here to analysis. And because this is a static structural simulation, there really isn't time that exists for your simulation. There is pseudo time. So the whole idea of a static structural is it will run your simulation until all your node forces are counterbalancing any um, boundary conditions that you have. 
So once everything's in equilibrium, that will be your steady state results, and that will be when your simulation finishes. Because you don't know how long that actually takes in real time, um, you have pseudo time instead that you're working in, and pseudo time is by default one second. So if you want, you can control this. So if you, for example, know that um, your simulation, you want it to act as if it was taking 10 seconds and your load is applying over 10 seconds, but slowly, then you can say um, the, mac the uh, maximum amount of time is 10 seconds and you can define where your time steps are. So your solution would apply your load for like 0.1 seconds, grab the results, another 0.1 seconds, grab the results, 0.1 seconds, grab the results, and uh, so on and so forth. In our case, we're dealing with something super simple. So we're just gonna turn time stepping to program controlled and that answers handily. But that's how that works. So now in terms of boundary conditions, you have all these different boundary conditions that you can apply to your model. So for example, if you have acceleration, or gravity, pressure, forces, if you're dealing with bolts and screws and you don't want to actually model threads, you can have a specific boundary condition uh, that is related to bolt pretensioning. You can have a thermal boundary condition, so you can include thermal effects. You can do displacements, you can do various kinds of supports, you can have a fluid solid interface of your coupling with ANSYS Fluent. You can also, um, import Python code directly onto your model. If you have a special Python code that is looking into something specific or your model grabbing information or something, all that you can do here. Our purposes, we're saying simple here, uh, just fix support. So the fix support is gonna be these faces right here. So it's gonna ask you to select the faces, make sure that you're dealing with the faces, face, face. And what I'm doing is I'm pressing control and clicking, so control click, control click, control click, control click. And now it says I selected eight faces, and it is eight faces, two for each. And so these are gonna be fixed support, and by fixed support, it means it's not allowed to rotate in X, Y, Z, or translate in X, Y, or Z. Um, and in this way, basically these elements and nodes are not gonna be allowed to move, but everything else is gonna be allowed to move and deform around these fixed uh, spots. Now, the last thing we need is an actual force of some kind. So let me just double check what I put here. Yeah, I added a force of 25,000 newtons on these two holes in the downward y direction. So what we're going to do is just the same. Insert force, both of these holes, and we're going to do 25,000 newtons. And we're going to make the direction be in the negative y direction. So now you can see here, it's going to apply 25,000 newtons in the negative y direction. That's why there's a negative sign here. And the arrow is indicating as such. And with that, you can see here now the question mark turns into a lightning bolt. Meaning, as far as ANSYS is concerned, it has everything it needs to actually solve this simulation. So now you can go ahead, right click this, and click solve. And now it'll start solving. And if you're interested, you can take a look at the solution information. And it'll start spitting out things related to your simulation. So, for example, uh, oh, it's already done. But uh, yeah, if you take a look at the solution information, they'll say, oh, this is ANSYS solver. Here are all the packages that you have. Uh, here's the units you're working in. Uh, here are your boundary conditions that, that you're applying. Uh, here are any issues that we found with the elements. They might be an issue, they may not be. Um, then it also says, oh, um, here's how much mass is in your uh, system. Here's where the center of mass is. Um, here's what makes up all your elements. And it says that if you have any warnings or errors, you can look into it here. It tells you how many cores you have on the computer. It tells you um, how long it took to solve the simulation, how much memory used, every single detail about actual solving it finds here. And now that this is done, you can take a look at the results. So for example, let's take a look at stresses. Let's take a look at uh, strains. Oh, already looked at that. Insert, stress. And they can take also look, take a look at total deformation and then evaluate all results. 
So you can see here, you have your equivalent elastic strain. And by default, ANSYS tries to exaggerate how much this is gonna move. So right now it's 300 times the normal amount of movement, just to show you the exaggerated way it's gonna move. But if you want, you can return this back to true scale. And you can see here, it's not really moving much. And in fact, um, if you take a look at the total deformation, it actually only moves 0.03 millimeters which makes sense because this is pretty much a solid piece of structural steel. So you wouldn't expect it to move much in the first place. But now if you take a look at stresses, you can see where you have stress concentrations occurring. So it looks like in our case, if we do a maximum minimum, the areas that are under highest amount of stress are where it's attached to the wall over here. But because this is such a fine mesh, I wouldn't really trust these results. I would just say, okay, more, most likely than not, the reasons of high stresses are gonna be uh, right here at the wall. So once you actually do a finer uh, mesh, you can actually take a look at the actual results. And in this case, when I had done the simulation and I used a much finer mesh, let me open this up. What I ended up finding was that um, the peak stresses were actually 262.33 megapascals. And, um, and this was under the 0.5 millimeter uh, mesh density. So that's the um, max peak amount of stress. And so the other thing you need to look into is the uh, fatigue analysis. So if you take a look at the fatigue analysis, not the fatigue analysis, uh, where is it? Stress level, maximum equivalent stress safety factor. And if you evaluate this, you can see here that it says our safety factor is 1.7559. And if you guys have never dealt with safety factor before, if you, if you take your safety factor, your minimum safety factor, and multiply it by whatever load you have, that is theoretically how much extra load your device, your model can take before uh, buckling and breaking all on its own. So in this case, it says I can apply 1.7559 times extra amount of load before my product will, before my model fails because of stress concentrations. Now, I know for a fact that this is not the true value and it's actually much lower than this. And this is mainly an issue because of the mesh density. The actual value is closer to, uh, actually it's, it's actually closer to 0.953 once you've done a proper mesh analysis on it. So really my, uh, this uh, bracket can only support 0.953 times the load. So the load we've applied is too much in the first place. So now is a case where we actually do a redesign. And so the redesign I chose is these thinner hooks where these hooks are put placed here to redistribute the loads and provide more stability. I also added um, I reduced the hooks with the um, hooks with here and these supports here to see if that can reduce the weight as well. And in a similar case to what we had before, you would replace your geometry, you would mesh it, you would then do your setup and put your boundary conditions, and then you look at your results. And that's what I have here. And the second design concept. So if I edit this instead. And I close this. So while this is starting up, any questions? So if I understand correctly, factor of safety is how much more it can take than the baseline. Uh, or in this, in this instance, it's 25,000 newtons. Yeah, so you just take your factor of safety, multiply it by whatever load you're applying, and that's theoretically how much your model can take before failure. Okay. You can do other types of analysis where you do like a fatigue analysis based on number of cycles, but that would require to please have more traffic. Yep, time dependent. Yeah, so in this case, I replaced the geometry, but the actual forces and everything are the exact same. And now when you take a look at it, you can see the stresses are slightly different. And you can see the factor of safety has also increased to 1.0658 as well. And if you take a look at the actual mesh we're dealing with, it's much finer than the one we had in the other model. 
and the end results ended up being that now the peak stresses are 234.56, factor of safety was 1.0658. And if you compare them, we basically reduced the weight by a couple grams. The factor of safety went from 0.953 to 1.0658. Peak stresses were reduced from 262.33 to 234.56. So reduced weight by 3.7%, increased factor of safety by 11.8%. And reduce peak stresses by 10.586%, all without actually making the device, and which could have cost us maybe hundred, uh, hundreds of dollars, and actually testing it and seeing how much it can withstand to failure. So that's how you can quickly compare two design concepts, and you can do this on any number of different concepts um, very quickly. But because this is a workshop, I took my time explaining everything. But you can imagine that you can have like 30 different design concepts, all with very similar boundary conditions that you can run simulations one after the other and see what different results you get for each. So before I continue um, to the second uh, example I have, which is on stent deployments, so more BME oriented, any questions on the bracket stuff? I guess um an added layer of nuance would be once you manufacture it, depending on the, on the methods you can manufacture it, um, it also affects the final the final stress. Or in this case, if it's a three printed part, since it's by layers. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, usually when you um, um, do an actual manufacturing, uh, one thing I often find students doing correctly is they'll do a simulation on, let's say a bracket piece like this that's solid throughout, and then they'll do a 3D print instead. But the 3D print has in, uh, infill density and into infill uh, shape associated with it. That's not uh, infill of 100%. And when you're doing 3D printing, there's actually like orthogonality to it. So depending on how you're printing it, if it's this way or this way, and the students then wonder why is it that the product uh, either fails under load under a given way when the simulation says it wouldn't. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of things that just a straightforward simulation would not teach you, but once you've actually done the um, actual printing or actually machining it, that's where you end up figuring out the, where the discrepancies lie. And now let's focus in on the stunt deployments of the BME thing instead. So in this case, the question is going to be, will arterial tissue experience adverse levels of mechanical stress following a standard stent deployment? So the solution here is, let's create a normal stent deployment geometry inside an artery that has a plaque deposit. Let's deploy the stent to open up the artery and then observe the wall stresses that occur because of the deployed stent. And now let's compare this with literature information on threshold for hoop stresses in a wall and see if um, the amount of stresses that we're seeing in our model are approaching the levels that are associated with adverse cell remodeling. So first, you can actually make your geometry. And I made this um, myself before the um, for this workshop. So you can see here you have uh, a model for your artery that has three layers that are commonly associated with it. You have your intima, your media, your epithelia. You have your custodic plaque, which is um, sort of bulbous region right here. You have this stent, which is in yellow here, around this uh, balloon structure here, which is going to inflate and expand this stent. And so what we're going to do is this balloon is going to inflate to 0.55 millimeters or radial displacement. And then the ends of the artery here are going to be fixed in space. And then we're just going to see what the results are going to be from this. So. First off, we're gonna to need to know some material properties naturally. So we try to look up material properties for arteries. We're gonna go down a very long rabbit hole of people arguing of what, which type of material properties you should use for a biological material. But uh, I'm just gonna say, let's try to use them so they're consistent with each other. In which case we're gonna use what's called a mooney revlin model. A mooney revlin model is a type of hyperelastic material property. So if you've heard of linear elastic, where it's like a rubber band where you stretch it, and it comes back to normal. Hyperelastic means you stretch it, and then instead of uh, coming back to normal, you can actually stretch it beyond the normal amount, so called hyperelasticity. And usually you get a response curve like this, where if you have relatively uh, small amounts of stresses, 
then it behaves elastically. But then once you apply the enough amount of stress, it behaves hyperelastically, where it has this curve associated with it. And each of the layers has their own specific curve. So, and you can fit them with uh, what's called the Mooney Rivlin model, and you have these coefficients associated with it. Same thing with the um, balloon material. It has its own special material properties and uh, coefficients. And the only one that's seemingly normal is the stent because it's metal. So for the stent, we're, uh, we're going to assume it has a uh, Young's modulus of 200 gigapascals and a uh, Poisson's ratio of 0.3, and that's linear elastic. The rest of these are going to be hyperelastic, but we're going to assume the stent is the only thing that's linear elastic in this entire thing. So I already have this all done because, as I'm sure you can imagine, um, given the fact that this is the kind of type of uh, simulations that Medtronic or Edwards or big tech companies would do, this is not very straightforward type of simulation. It requires a lot of in, 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 uh, detailed little bells and whistles to get it to work nicely. So I have this all done already. I'll like walk you through each of the little steps I do. So first off, engineering data, like I said before. So you have each of your different properties here. You have your Kia, your intima media, your plaque, the balloon structure, and the structure of steel is gonna be your spent. So you can see here that each of these have an octane third order model associated with it, which you can find here by literally just grabbing the hyperelastic material model, grab this, put it here, and then it'll ask you for the material properties associated with it. And that's where you put in the values here, the negative 7.04, the megapascals, the A1 value, the compressibility values. These are all things you find from the In a similar way, uh, the balloon is a Mooney Revlin two parameter model. So it has a C10 and a C01 and incompressibility uh, parameter. And also these things come directly from it. And then if you take a look at the actual geometry, and I open it up in space plane. Oh, I think something, somebody put something in the chat. It is pretty awesome. Especially when uh, you see that whatever you're trying to simulate matches up to actual validation data that you see in uh, medical journals, that's when it's really interesting. All right, so here's the model. And the best way to view this is if you do a cut plane section. So I can see you have your three layers. You have display, record. So you have your plaque thing here. And then you have your balloon, and then you have your stand structure. And you can see here, I've organized it on my map to show each of the different parts. So if you just take a look at the stand, design, whole thing, here's your stand. It's not the most nicest looking stand. There are many different kinds that are available in market, but this is just one thing I quickly found online. Balloon is really just a cylinder. And you have the different layers of your arteries with the plaque. And one thing that you might notice, if you look at it very closely, if you take a look at it in a long view, there's actually a very small gap between each of the layers. And I'm doing this small gap so that ANSYS can automatically detect that there's a very small gap between layers. And whenever there's a really small gap, I'm talking like less than 0.1 millimeters between any two surfaces, ANSYS automatically assumes that you want those two surfaces to connect to each other, and it automatically tries to bond them to each other. Otherwise, if I had made it actually flush with this surface, ANSYS instead thinks, oh, these surfaces are actually one surface, so I'm actually just going to make this all one thing. Yeah. So that's a little thing they learn once you dealt with these enough. So. That's how that looks like. Now, if you open up the actual model, and if you noticed in this case, we're not dealing with a uh, stru tag structure, we're dealing with what's called explicit dynamics. Explicit dynamics is largely used for if you're dealing with something that is highly nonlinear, or it's moving really fast, or it's distorting a humongous amount. And in this case, it's not that we're moving really quickly, but because we deal with very nonlinear materials, the artery, the balloon, the deformations that's going to have, and because they're very large deformations, explicit analysis is what we're going to want to do because 
in a stack structural approach, it tries to iteratively solve those motion equations, those force displacements and stiffness. But because it's iterative, there's a chance where it's not going to be able to find the equilibrium state where all the forces balance out. But in explicit analysis, it actually finds the exact answer without having to do any um, iterative estimation. And it finds the exact solution because it does it on such a fine time step that it does not need to do any iteration in the first place. So in this case, you have your geometry. You have everything loaded up here. I've hidden the balloon just to show you the main thing here, you have your artery. And it's just about to make contact with the plaque stent. You have all your different material properties. And just like before, you can click any one of these and change what their material assignments are. And as I mentioned before, you can control your coordinate system. So I made a cylindrical coordinate system to fit this cylindrical setup we have here. And in this cylindrical coordinate system, we're dealing with uh, we're dealing with basically the Y is going to be theta, the X is radial, and the Z is axial, which you define here. So instead of dealing with the normal X, Y, Z, we're going to deal with the spherical, the cylindrical coordinate system. And here's where I mentioned the thing about the contacts. So if you notice here, there is a contact definition that's been applied automatically between the plaque and the stent. So you can see here, one surface is blue and one surface is red. To ANSYS, this means that these two surfaces are gonna contact with each other. And I've set this up to have a frictional contact definition with a coefficient of friction of 0.25. And similarly, because of those small gaps I made between the different uh, layers of the artery, ANSYS automatically found the contact regions. So for example, between the media and intima, between the media and adventia, and between the intima and the plaque. And now that um, I uh, specified those sub uh, millimeter regions, ANSYS automatically made a bonded contact between those. And as far as ANSYS is now concerned, it's gonna uh, pretend that there's no gap between them and it's gonna deform as if it's one thing, but with each of the respective individual material properties. And um, now if you take a look at the mesh, it's not the finest mesh, but it's enough of a mesh to get results that we can uh, start seeing how it's gonna work. So you can see here, it's a different color for each of the individual pieces, indicating that ANSYS, think, ANSYS knows these are not all one thing. If all of this was one color, then that means ANSYS thinks it's all one thing, in which case uh, there's something wrong with your model. And now, just as, as we did before, you have to apply your boundary conditions. So in this case, you need to specify how long you want your simulation to last. And because using ANSYS explicit is done on a fast time scale, you need to apply a very short time scale to do this on. But a good rule of thumb is I just use one E negative three. So that'd be one millisecond, I think. I think that's one millisecond. And so all this is gonna happen over a course of one millisecond, but it should be fine because the actual movement is so slow that even if it occurred over 0 0.1, 0 um, uh, 1 millisecond, it shouldn't uh, result in any adverse kinetic energy uh, in your model. So you have your fixed supports, which are the two ends of the artery here. You have a displacement boundary condition that I've tied to this, the cylindrical coordinate system that we defined earlier. And you can see here that the displacement is gonna be on the stent. And I'm gonna say displace one millimeter based off the cylindrical coordinate system. And then that's pretty much all you need to get it to run. Now I'm not gonna actually run this simulation because it takes a while, but I do have the results. So yeah, um, you can see here, I actually did a, a more finer mesh when I actually did the results. But first off, if you take a look at the, just the step itself and what it's doing, when I ran the simulation over the course of one second, then you can see here that it goes from zero to 0 0.5 uh, uh, millimeter deformation. Um, oh, this should be a 0 0.5, whatever. Um, um, for the stent, so you can see the stent deployed properly. And if you take a look at the arterial stresses, so the stent is pushing up against the, against the plaque, 
So you can imagine that it's going to impart stresses wherever the metal is meeting the uh, plaque. And in this case, it looks like we're getting uh, stress values of 0.164 megapascals, which is the same thing as 164 kilopascals. So then now all that's left is you can compare the literature. Well, remember the original question was, will the arterial tissue experience adverse levels of mechanical stress according to the stent deployment? Well, if you do a 0.5 millimeter stent expansion using our particular stent geometry, we got 164 for uh, kilopascals for our peak. And literature reports that adverse stresses uh, for wall food stress only occur at values exceeding 310 kilopascals, meaning we shouldn't expect any adverse cell remodeling from the surface endothelial layer, but we would require some in vivo validation to co uh, collaborate our results with them. And so this is from a study in 2008 that was looking at the high composition in arterial wall biomechanics. Um, so, and it's from the Journal of Endovascular Therapy, a fairly high impact journal. So you can sort of trust that these results are gonna be uh, good. And that's pretty much all I wanted to show you. Thank you, question.